I'm Sam, and we did erythropoietin for EPO and leptin. So erythropoietin in the human body is known as human erythropoietin, and you can genetically clone this and form recombinant human erythropoietin, which was a major breakthrough for diseases such as anemia and HIV and AIDS. And then some brief history about EPO and sports doping was in the winter during the World Winter Recreation and Olympic Games. They used to use herbal extracts such as ma and nog, which is now known as a form of ephedrine, which is on the banned substance list for sports. But in 1984, the U.S. cycling team was found to have been blood doping after they'd already won a medal, and that was stopping over 20 gold members. Um, and then in 1987, so a year after, or three years after that, um, the use of EPO was banned by the International Olympic Committee. But in 2002, in Utah at the Olympics, there was an Austrian cross-country cross -country skier coach who, after the Olympics ended, they all left in a panic and they became a house and was pricked by a needle and the police came and raided the house and they found evidence blood doping such as intravenous equipment and used blood bags. So he was banned then for the next two Winter Olympic Games, but he ended up returning in 2006. Um, and the police were notified of his arrival since he was not supposed to be there. Um, and then they raided his residence at that time and found more used blood bags, more syringes, and intravenous equipment. So the reason why blood doping is so popular in sports is because it increases the athlete's VO2 max, which allows them to perform maximal, maximally for longer periods of time. Um, and this is due to the oxygen transport in the body. So initially, whenever you take a breath in, you're bringing oxygen into your lungs, which can then diffuse across the alveoli into your blood um, down its concentration gradient. And this is called external respiration. Um, and then once the oxygen enter enters your bloodstream, it binds to hemoglobin that are in erythrocytes or red blood cells. And um, from there, this oxygen can then be transported to all the tissues in your body and diffused again through um, internal respiration into the cells, um, which the cells then use for um, work. It generates ATP. Um, so Oxygen use during rest and during exercise is very different. So as you can see here, your total blood flow at rest is um, pretty is smaller compared to whenever you're exercising, and this is mainly because of the skeletal muscle. So initially, you have um, 1,200 milliliters per minute flowing to your um, skeletal muscles, and then whenever you're working or you're exercising maximally, um, it's 1,200 microliters or milliliters per minute that are that's being brought to your um, your muscle tissue, your skeletal muscle tissues. And this is because as your muscles are working, they're going to need a lot more oxygen to produce more ATP, and um, which then produces work and allows you to um, exercise for longer periods of time. Um, and this is your VO2 max, which is um, which limits how hard you're able to work and for the duration that you're able to work. It's the and it is the maximum amount amount of oxygen that can be. Um, taken up by your tissues. So there's three main factors that affect this, um, the VO2 max, which affects how long and how hard athletes can train for. Um, first, it's cardiac output. So your heart rate and your stroke volume um, make up your cardiac output. So your heart rate is how fast your heart's beating, and your stroke volume is how the volume of blood, um, how much is being pumped out per beat. Um, and whenever you're exercising maximally, these two factors are maxed out, so your heart is beating as fast as it can, which allows um, for a certain amount of stroke volume, since it's not allowing the heart to fill um, as, as long as it possibly can. So with these two factors, your cardiac output is basically at its max. It can't be lifted any higher, so athletes can't find ways to increase their heart rate or increase their cardiac output um, beyond what they are able to do through training. Um, second, there's the arteriovenous oxygen difference, and what this is is the difference in concentration of oxygen in your arterioles. So before um, the oxygen is diffused into the tissues, and then after it diffuses, which is in the um, venous system. So this difference um, gives you how much oxygen is being or, yeah, moved into the tissues that can be used for work. 
Um, and at maximal exercise, this is at about 90%. Um, so you only have about a 10% difference that you can improve this by, but you're never going to have like a full 100% functioning um, arterial venous oxygen difference. There's always there's still going to be a little bit of oxygen in your venous system. Um, so again, another mechanism where athletes can't really use this to improve their VO2 max. But finally, the last option, um, hemoglobin concentration can be used um, and is what is used through blood doping to increase your VO2 max um, in athletes. And what this does is, um, for example, there's a study done where sedentary individuals who hadn't exercised were, um, were blood doping and they saw an increase in their VO2 max without any training at all. So without any exercise, they were able to increase the maximum amount that they possibly could exercise. And this basically just showed that when you increase the hemoglobin in your bloodstream, um, you're able to carry more oxygen to your tissues, which is then able to diffuse across and um, produce more work by your cells. So what is EPO um, and how is this used in blood doping? Erythropoietin is um, a glycoprotein that's naturally produced by your body in your renal cortex. Um, and whenever your tissues become hypoxic, whenever you're exercising, there's a decrease in oxygen that is brought to these tissues. Um, EPO is stimulated, the gene is stimulated in the um, renal cortex of the kidneys, and also there's a little bit of production in the liver as well. Um, and whenever this is stimulated, there, it increases the EPO gene transcription and then translation into the um, EPO protein hormone, um, which is then introduced into your circulatory system. So this is circulating around and it can bind to the EPOR receptor that is found in erythrocytic um, progenitor cells in the red bone marrow. And as soon as this binds, it initiates um, a, a long cascade of events that eventually divides these erythrocytic um, progenitor cells into erythrocytes or red blood cells that can be used to carry more oxygen to your tissues. There's three main ways where EPO is able to do this. Um, first, it stimulates proliferation, so it causes the red bone marrow to um, differentiate um, more than it is typically going to in the body. Um, it also induces differentiation, um, which is typically a 12-step process. Um, there's 12 different differentiation steps that the original progenitor cells have to go through to become erythrocytes. Um, and this typically takes 10 to 12 days, but with EPO, it um, allows it to occur quicker, so you're producing these red blood cells at a faster rate. And then finally, it prevents apoptosis, so your body's able to detect whenever these cells are um, proliferating and differentiating at a faster rate, and typically this would induce apoptosis to make sure you're at a normal level of red blood cells in your body, um, but EPO prevents this. Um, and allows your body to continue to produce red blood cells. Um, and so this increase in red blood cells increases your VO2 max and how long you're able to maintain this VO2 max score, um, which obviously is beneficial to athletes. Um, and that's like the main mechanism behind blood doping. So before this is what your blood, your blood looks like, you only have a certain amount, and then whenever you're doping, you increase your red blood cells um, through EPO. Um, different mechanisms and that is allows athletes to train harder um, and bring up their VO2 max which translates into winning off more gold medals. So how to avoid doping. So there are erythropoietin associated agents such as erythropoietin peptides or EFPs which are synthetic cyclic peptides that are unrelated to the recombinant hemoglobin or hemoglobin, um, but they can bind to erythropoietin receptors and activate the cascade to create erythrocytes. So um, your artificially stimulated um, EFPs or red blood cells. And then there's also a group of stabilizers that under hypoxia conditions can activate the EPO gene and decrease EPO to increase erythrocyte um, and then human erythropoietin is a gene dope to or gene clone to become recombinant erythropoietin, which we talked about in the beginning, which is artificial EPO. Um, but that has been shown to increase your VO2 max by about 
which can increase your endurance by about 8%. Since you're increasing your EPO, you're increasing your kinetic crit, which allows you to have a, a larger ability to put oxygen to your tissues or to your active muscles. Um, and then natural movement training and altitude. So when you're at altitude, you are increasing your production of EPO because hypoxia is the stimulus for opioid production. So overall, at higher altitude, you have a decreased arterial, arterial blood saturation, um, impaired oxygen delivery to your tissues, and an inhibited, inhibited oxidative metabolism. So your initial exposure, when you have your initial exposure at altitude, your first response will be a decrease in plasma volume, a, um, an increase in heart rate, and an increase in, ventil in ventilation rate. But a more long-term or hours after your exposure, you will have increased erythroblastic um, production, um, which means greater oxygen delivery to your active muscles. And then this can also um, partially counteract your VO2 max impairment that is caused by the hypoxia um, or the increase in altitude. And then an example is in 1968, there was a Kenyan runner who won the 1500 meter race. And that kind of drove the research for blood, do blood doping and like that came from altitude because if you live high in training, so if you come from altitude, you have thick blood, which helps them when they're thin air. And then blood transfusions are the process where you take blood or blood-based products and introduce them into your circulatory system. So there's two different types of blood transfusions. There's autologous and homologous. So autologous transfusions are an infusion of your own blood into circulatory system. So this is blood that's been either refrigerated or frozen, and it's better to freeze it because you lose less red blood cells that way, like they don't die as quickly. Um, and then homologous, you take um, blood from a donor who has the same blood type as you and infuse that into your blood. Um, but generally these stored um, blood needs to be infused 27 days before your competition or event. Overall, autologous blood transfusions are safer because you have less of a risk for immune responses or blood type mismatch because even though you use the same blood type, you have different antigens on the blood, which could lead to an immune response. And you also have less of a risk for transfusion shock and diseases such as HIV, um, hepatitis, and malaria. And then the common endocrine Gene doping is administered subcutaneously or through intravenous injections. And this is just a fun picture showing how much longer you can live with your blood doping. So there's lots of long-term side effects um, that are seen whenever athletes are blood doping, primarily in your cardiovascular system, because this is where the EPO um, and the extra red blood cells are located. Um, polycythemia is whenever there's an increased viscosity of the blood, um, and whenever you're increasing the viscosity, you're increasing the blood pressure, which can cause various um, cardiovascular diseases associated with this, in addition to headaches, um, hypertension, and hyperviscosity, which is the extra thickness of the blood. Um, this then leads to a decrease in cardiac output um, and an increase in blood pressure. And whenever you increase your blood pressure, you're increasing the resistance. So for example, here, um, Whenever you're increasing the amount of red blood cells, you're increasing the pressure. Um, there's an increase here, so, or you're increasing the resistance. So you're putting more pressure on your blood vessels. Um, and then this eventually can lead to thromboembolic events, um, which is whenever blood clots are formed and then are then dislodged in, in circulation in your body. Um, and then this, this blood clot can then insert itself in any um, blood vessel within your body, um, primarily it would insert within your brain or within your heart. Um, and these are two very serious sites. Um, and if it inserts into your brain, it can lead to strokes or seizure, seizures, or if it's in your heart, it can lead to ischemia or infarction, so like heart attacks. Um, additionally, your liver and your kidneys are where uh, the EP 
EPO production is simulated. So if you're using the EPO simulating agents, um, you can be susceptible to overproduction damage. So your kidneys um, can produce too much EPO, which can damage them um, and cause renal toxicity, which can then lead to renal failure um, if you're not careful and if you aren't drinking a lot of water to compensate for the increase in um, hematocrit that is being produced through the EPO. Um, your skeletal system, so another target of the EPO mechanism is um, the red bone marrow, which is found in your lung bones. Um, and hyperproliferation increases the amount of red bone marrow that is lost. So yellow bone marrow is then um, transformed into red bo bone marrow to compensate for this. And this switch back and forth between the red and yellow bone marrow can, bone marrow can make your bones very brittle um, and reduce the thickness um, and, and increase your susceptibility to um, fractures and bone breaks, especially if you are in um, long endurance races, just cycling or um, long distance running. And additionally, um, probably the most serious is sudden deaths. Um, in the late eight, uh, 1980s, there was a four-year span where 20 European cyclists were found to have cardiovascular um, deaths that were related back to their blood doping. Um, so it's super serious and lots of long-term effects, um, mainly due to your cardiovascular system, and it can cause death like any of the cyclists that were found. There's about 20 of them. So despite these... Um, Bad effects, there's also lots of clinical applications that blood doping can be used for. Um, for example, in anemia, in anemia, there is a decrease of iron in your blood, which decreases your ability to circulate or bring oxygen to your tissues. Um, so for example, here you see there's a less, a lower amount of red blood cells than in normal blood. And whenever anemic patients um, use blood doping techniques or something along these lines, it allows their blood to become normal. and um, increases the amount of oxygen that they're able to bring to their tissues. Um, additionally, any kind of trauma or surgery, um, cardiothoracic or liver surgery, that is that causes a large increase in um, blood loss, you are definitely susceptible to um, a decrease in oxygen and perfusion um, in your body. So uh, blood doping can help with this just by increasing your red blood cell count and the blood that is circulating in your body. Um, additionally, chemotherapy, uh, chemotherapy patients. Um, chemotherapy targets cells that are rapidly proliferating, which is what's happening in your red bone marrow as the erythrocytic progenitor cells are turning into your erythrocytes. Um, that's a long um, process that are, the cells are rapidly dividing, so chemo um, targets this. Um, and so there needs to be a way for the red bone marrow that is still um, there to proliferate into red blood cells so that these chemotherapy patients are able to um, keep their immune system up and fight the cancer. Um, and EPO can, again, help with that by causing increasing proliferation and decreasing um, its cell apoptosis. And then finally, in AIDS and premature infants, um, the treatment that is that EPO typically targets is an increase in their blood circulation, which can then help them fight um, immune infections and things like that. Additionally, there's a new area of research that is looking into medically supervised doping in sports, and some of their more recent findings um, shows that EPO and blood doping mechanisms can increase um, healing and muscle, muscle tears. So if you're like a professional athlete or a long endurance athlete, you're constantly tearing your muscles and beating your body up, so you need a quick heal um, and a quick fix to kind of get you back on the field or back um, playing your sport. So um, blood doping can increase the blood and the oxygen that is brought to these tissues, which can increase the healing process. Um, additionally, even just after like soreness um, and tiredness that is associated with sports, um, EPO can help with this. So it improves recovery and heals your muscle tears and athletes. So detection and prevention of EPO. <clears throat> so while they were in the process of um, prohibiting recombinant human erythropoiesis, there was some concern that it would be hard to detect the use since it is very similar to its natural form of human erythropoiesis. However, um, these were obviously um, overlooked since there are detection methods such as direct, indirect, and then transfusion. So direct detection is with your urine, so you get a urine sample. And um, most of the metabolites of doping substances are excreted by your kidneys in your urine. But specifically for human erythropoietin, recombinant erythropoietin, human erythropoietin, 
um, you can use an isoelectric focusing test to separate the hemorrhoid effluent from the complement because they have a different composition of carbohydrates. But um, once you separate them, you can see that at a specific pH, the molecules have a different charge that the um, isoelectric focusing test can detect. So this means that the charge of the recombinant hemorrhoid effluent is less negative than that of the hemorrhoid effluent, and then therefore you can detect if someone has hemorrhagism or not with PGO. Um, in your detection, so you want to get your biomarkers with an athlete biological passport, and this just means that there's differences in bi biomarkers um, by altered or lipases, and these biomarkers are things like hematocrit, hemoglobin, and Reticulocyte count, and your reticulocytes are just immature red blood cells. Um, but the accuracy of this test is harder to rely on because um, these blood samples need to be collected within 24 hours after the last recombinant hemorrhagic injection. And then um, transfusion detection. So the two types again, homologous and autologous. Homologous is obviously easier to detect since it's not your own blood with different antigen, and you can clearly distinguish whose blood is whose, or like yours and not yours, um, because of the mismatched blood group antigens. And then homologous is harder since it is coming from your own body. Um, the effectiveness of anti-doping campaigns for like prevention um, is like you can, if you're caught doping, there's two different like there's different types of punishment. You can fined or banned. Um, fines, I guess, if, if you have like a minor um, you know, infraction, if you're doing something wrong and you can charge a spe specific amount of money, but then banned, if you are found in your first violation and you get banned, you're getting up to four years, and then your second one, you're going to have a lifetime ban for participating in any sporting events at the Olympics, but then the effectiveness of these anti-doping campaigns, there's a study done on track and field athletes and um, top level cyclists and the three pillars. So there's three pillars of um, like effectiveness, which are risk of detection, punishment, and communication. And the top level cyclists and the track and field athletes determined that these three pillars are effective for anti-doping, but it would be more effective to focus your attention on improving diagnostics for, for doping. Um, instead of using ban banning and fines. So some additional information um, for an increased action of erythropoietin, since there are other hormones that affect the production of erythropoietin, such as testosterone, growth hormone, and growth um, factor one, which testosterone is important in this because men tend to have higher hematocrit, which makes sense because they have these androgens like testosterone that can increase your production of erythropoietin, which then increases the amount of oxygen that can be um, carried around in your blood. Um, and then there's out of competition testing. So this is when your athlete or participate, participant is being tested when they're not currently in competition. Um, this kind of raised some concerns because we had to keep tabs on them at, like athletes at all times in order to be able to find them and um, test them for doping. And then also if they were unaware like how appropriate it was to show up at their home and work and do these types of tests. Um, but they solved this with a whereabout tool, which is just when the athletes have to provide um, their location to an anti-doping organization which allows them to be easily found to be tested. And then some special cases are with, was with a Swedish athlete who had both of his testes removed for various health reasons. So after losing that, he would need um, testosterone to make up for the loss. And then he had to get permission from anti-doping organizations in order to compete because he was taking testosterone but they monitored his levels to make sure that they were within a normal range and not above, which would lead to increased erythropoietin um, production, which would lead to more red blood cells. 
but situations like this became more popular when other medication were added to the pro prohibited substances list, such as glucocorticoids, beta blockers, and diuretics, since these medications help people who have diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease or necrotic syndrome just a couple of years ago. And then to avoid detection, you can microdose. Uh, microdosing is when you reduce your dosage of the complement of the curcumin, um, but you increase the frequency of these injections. But you do this preferably at night because that is when you would be less likely to be tested for blood doping while in competition. Um, and you do this with increasing your frequency but decreasing the amount. So you would drink lots of water and wait for your urine sampling so that you would dilute your urine, which could decrease the amount of your common amino acid gluten in your urine and make it harder to detect. 